Oui, fille. Hello. Hello. Hi, Tim. Hi, Tim. Hi, Tim. Hi, Tessa. Susie. Hello. Hello, Susie. Hello. How's the, how's the fire? How's the fire crest population in the country? Uh, yes, yes, along the main road in Hyde Heath. <laughs> Excellent. We haven't, uh, we haven't got any firecrests tonight, I'm afraid, Susie. So uh, oh. <laughs> you can try and you can try and find one for us on Saturday. Yeah, well, I want I want, <laughs> I want I want I want lesser white throats and garden warblers, please. Oh right. Mm. Yeah, we'll, we'll 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 do our best. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Might have to send you off somewhere else. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, you you will. Um, I've um, Nick's. Uh, what is Nick? Do? He's surveying or something tonight, isn't he? He's doing. He's doing something clever. Got a, he's got a cluster farm meeting, I think, or something. He's, that's it. He's got a cluster farm. So, as you will probably all know, most of you know me as Simon. My name isn't Chilton's Conservation Board, um, but um, I've logged in as the Chilton's Conservation Board, which means I think <laughs> if I change my name, it'll probably stay on their profile. So, uh, well, but so actually, we could have a lot of fun with this. Really, we could change it to, to whatever we wanted to really but we're in control um yeah. but as this is being recorded and, and nick will probably watch this back we better not better not say too much <laughs> yeah, yeah, he, yeah. He, 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 he shouts yeah. at me and dave quite a lot actually <laughs> <laughs> no you know it's, it's the end it's the end of the surveys we you know we, we can be open it's uh He's a, he's, a, he's a cruel and heartless boss. No, he's, uh, he's lovely. And even better, he's going to be funding our breakfasts on Saturday. Oh, yeah. So, yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that doesn't mean like me and Dave are going to do, you can order double breakfasts. Okay, that's, um, that'd be, you know, that'd be a bit rude. <laughs> so how's everybody done with their servers? Everybody done early and late visits for all their squares? Yeah. yeah. Not very inspiring. It seemed a bit quiet, I thought, compared with the last time I went. I started at six o'clock, which I thought was early enough. <laughs> was that 6 p.m. or 6 a.m.? <laughs> 6 a.m. <laughs> Just testing. I've got one more to do, one more late visit tomorrow morning. And that's me done. For... I had a couple of obliging yellow hammers that sat on the fence right in front of me. That was the highlight, really. Oh, nice. <laughs> Excellent. We love, we, love, we love obliging the yellow hammers. Yeah. That's right. I think I, I, it's it's obviously uh, it's holiday select, season, I think. Select band. It is a select band. So we will uh, um, we will we will crack on. Um it's a, it's a it's a it's a little bit different um this evening because obviously we're ramping up to saturday um when hopefully uh some of you most of you hopefully will be joining us at college lake we're going to give you all the details uh, about what that's going to entail um as uh, as always uh, there'll be a a, a a small dose of of healthy competition um as uh, i i think unless it's changed dave i think you were going to go off to the left and I was going to go to the right or you were going to go to the right and I was going to go to the left um, um <laughs> or we can or we can spend the first half an hour harmoniously um looking over the marsh chatting amongst ourselves and then we can um, you know sort of uh, go our merry ways but it might be really nice because um there'll be different focus different groups having different oh, focus there won't be uh, you know 30 of us um, um, no it's, it's got uh, 30 of us um, sort of uh, lolloping rounds together sort of thing. Uh, and then obviously we'll meet back at uh, at the uh, at, at 10. Dave and I will be in constant uh, contact, of course, um, gripping each other off on, on what each group has. <laughs> I mean, has you mean sharing, to. you mean sharing information? Sharing information so that both groups can uh, can adopt. Um, the, the, the bad news or the sad news is, uh, Dave, is Mariki uh, isn't being able to make it. So oh, yeah. if anyone remembers Mariki from last year, there is a, Mariki would have, would have liked to have been there at 5am to uh, make sure everything was in, in place 
um, so we could go around and tick it in, in quick order. So she does send her best regards. Um, but uh, obviously, with uh, you know, with, with the cheerleader out of the way, we'll we'll we'll, we'll see what we can do. So, uh, um, but yeah, it's um, it's meant to be a little bit of um, uh, a, a break, a, a little bit of a change from uh, from what uh, what you were used to, which is lolloping and yomping around farmland and uh, all the uh, all the good stuff that we've been doing, and a bit of a relax as well. End of uh, end of the survey season, as, and you know, as I said. Um, Nick's stumping up for breakfast, so uh, that'll be uh, a lovely, a lovely finale. Nick's coming over as well on Saturday um, to be able to uh, share that with us as well. Okay, <clears throat> so I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, da, da, da. There we go. Right, you should see a wonderful um, feeding station there some of you might have recognized that if you've got on your farm clusters in the background there that's actually one of the farms uh, the new clusters that we're looking at over in uh, Bedfordshire was where that uh, picture was taken um so we are going to be as I say it's our finale it's our it's our last it's our last session of 2023 and uh you know, Dave and I have, I think Dave and I, um, it's, fingers crossed that we're going to be coming back, uh, coming back next year uh, to deliver more of these sessions for you. We're very much going to be talking about what Saturday is going to hopefully bring in terms of some of the species as well. And you'll be, you'll be pleased that we've, you see, we've just lumped everything into other birds. That's basically what we've spent the last four sessions doing um, is sort of, is talking about those other birds. Um, but you'll be pleased to know we have a quiz tonight, so it's going to be very much uh, <laughs> hopefully interactive for you. Don't don't panic too much. Um, that is a picture of the wonderful College Lake um, that we're going to be wandering around on Saturday. For those of you that haven't been there, it's a fantastic uh, bee bout reserve, and we have a very special access. So the reserve typically doesn't open until 10 a.m., so we're going to be going in at uh, a lot earlier than that. Um, and we're going to basically have the whole of the reserve to ourselves, which is just a, a fantastic um, privilege uh, that we're going to be able to uh, to do that as well. Yeah, so okay. Well done, Nick. Yeah, Nick's a, uh, he's a he's, he, when he when he gets negotiating, he's, uh, he's, he's absolutely awesome. Um, so we wanted to because we've been talking about, you know, the, the chalk, the chalk farmlands that we're, we're all used to. You know, why are we going to College Lake? Well, we're going to College Lake because it's one of the, um, we went to Tring Reservoirs last time and we thought we, we'd, we'd give you a little bit of an overview um, of the of the water birds. But actually, from a uh, an ecology perspective, wetlands are super important. Uh, the biodiversity, uh, incredible, it attracts herons, geese, waders, but it also, all the fringes, um, you'll see in that sort of picture there, all the fringes of these lakes also include warblers, reed buntings. Um, they're just they're just a fantastic gathering. And we're quite lucky in Buckinghamshire. We've got quite a few of these types of wetlands. We're also blessed with some fantastic uh, waterways, canals, rivers, uh, uh, amongst other things as well. Um, and the thing for a lot of these places is they are very vulnerable, especially the coastal elements. And, you know, we see sort of, we're talking about tidal power and also developments on these spaces. These are the, these are where the, the waders and the, and the ducks, they go to feed during the winter. Uh, and we're, you know, sometimes we're, we're systematically destroying some of those wetlands. So these inland waterways are becoming much more, uh, much more important for, for bird survivals and you know in mine and, and Dave's lifetime we, we've seen some of these water birds and waders uh, significantly diminish so places like uh, College Lake where they're breeding red shanks they're breeding lapwings are really sort of uh, that last bastion of hope that we can and more of these uh, reserves get created um, the, uh, the better the bird life is going to be. So this is College Lake um, is there anybody who's coming on Saturday that's never been to College Lake? If you're not sort of yes or no in the chat, that's uh, that's absolutely fine. Um, we'd like you know if you, if we if we got some newbies um, on the uh, on on the trip, that would be fantastic. Um, College Lake is uh, is uh, is just a, a simply wonderful reserve. 
it's made up of these two large uh, areas of, uh, of water and liberally dotted around the whole of the site are these fantastic hides. Um, what I was surprised about, Dave, you might already know this, so I think there's like nine or ten hides on, on College Lake, uh, and I think I've been to two of them. <laughs> there are a few. I don't, I'm not sure whether they're all, all active at, uh, at the moment, but um, yeah, there are, there are quite a few sort of scattered around, especially on the, uh, what would be the, I don't know, the, the sort of the left-hand corner of the, uh, of the, uh, the picture there, photograph that you've got. Yeah, so we'll be. Um, but then we'll be there's other ones. There's other ones that are sort of more sort of mammally um, related rather than sort of bird related. <clears throat> yeah, so we'll be spending a little bit of time looking over the marshy areas, and uh, uh, and as I say, there's quite a few hides up at that first bit. But I think it'll be lovely, you know, for the two groups to just sort of cumulatively see what's out there. There's a couple of hides literally just by the visitor centre. Um, Dave and I will have our sort of our telescopes trained on all the goodies um, that we're going to be there. Um, there is a uh, there is a um, what's the word I'm, I'm a trigger warning that we have to uh, have to put out there. Um, as of about three days ago, there were quite a sizable amount of dead black headed gulls um, due to the avian influenza that's going on. Um, I think there were at least 19 on the main island. Now, whether or not uh, the reserve wardens would have picked those up, we don't know. Um, so again, you know, it's just a bit of a bit of a heads up that um, uh, unfortunately we we might see that site. Obviously, we won't be necessarily mm -hmm. focusing on that. But if you're wondering why, uh, you know, a lot of the a lot of the black eyed gulls is a, a much reduced um, set. Unfortunately, there these inland um, communities are getting quite impacted. But on the positive side, we are going to hopefully be seeing uh, a lot of other water birds. And because of that close proximity, which the gulls seem to thrive on and the terns, um, uh, even though the geese are, um, uh, you know, do flock together at the moment, they're quite sort of separated with their territories. So we're not seeing as many other water birds uh, impacted as we are the gulls. Um, so what we're going to whiz through now, and you'll notice there's a slightly different stance that Dave and I are sort of uh, taking tonight. Um, we're going we're gonna to glory in the majesty of some of these water birds and just give you a very sort of quick overview um, of what you might be uh, might be seeing and, and, uh, and what we hopefully will pick up um, on the reserve itself. Um, so what we are hoping for is some of these. These should need no introduction to uh, anyone that's wandered along any form uh, of waterway. Um, these are our only resident swans. We are unlikely to see Buicks or Hoopers. Um, they're in the far northern Taiga at the moment. Uh, so any swan that we see. And what you've started to see probably at your local reservoirs is large groups of these potentially failed breeders um, or first or second year birds that haven't really sort of got to grips with it yet. And they start to build up over the summer months. Um, now, what you'll notice here is um, we've, got, uh, we've got two options. Uh, we've got the male and the female. Uh, the male, um, uh, the key differentiating factor is, um, and uh, as rude as this sounds, I can't quite put it in a different way. Um, it's the size of the knob on the bill of the swan. So if you if you look there at the female, you can see there is a slight uh, a slight hump at the base of the bill. Um, and if you move to the male, you can see that that's actually quite a, a more a uh, sizable lump, lump I probably should have used. Um, it's a, uh, uh, again, the males will tend to have that more protective flow of the um, uh, of their wings pushed back, very defensive, uh, and again, slightly bigger, only marginally, um, but slightly bigger. Um, very graceful birds, as you as you probably know, um, but underneath all of that grace and, uh, and serenity, they're paddling away, a bit like humans really um we look serene on the surface but underneath we're paddling away trying to get through uh, the water and through life the next species we're hoping to see and um the great crested grebe actually it um it, it can do two um two broods so the, we you start to see a lot of the uh, pair displays um early on in the year in the spring 
and um, where you'll get the weed dance and uh, you'll get the sort of the, the presentation. And people think, oh, right, OK, that's that's now gone. But Great Crested Grebes pair um, throughout the year and they do a lot of those sort of uh, display elements to each other. Um, this is clearly a bird in, in full breeding plumage. Um, and some of you may not know that this in part, along with Little Egret, which is why the RSPB was formed in the first place. Um, so the great crested grebe plumes on the back of their neck, which looks so incredible on these graceful birds, um, apparently looked nice on people's hats. So unfortunately, great crested grebes were, were hunted almost to extinction in the UK for, the, uh, for their headwear, unfortunately. Um, as always, drop any uh, questions you have if we're going too fast um, in the chat. Dave is, uh, Dave is on the chat like a like a rocket, um, if there's anything that you uh, you want to know additionally about these birds. But again, we just wanted to give you a little bit of flavor tonight. We're not necessarily going into the minutiae of, uh, of identification, more just sort of uh, a few facts and figures about the uh, about the birds and hope that we'll, uh, we'll enjoy them on, uh, on the day. We're also hoping to see one of these um, little grebe. They are, as they say, they're quite a diminutive little grebe. Great crested grebe and little grebe are one of um, our four regular grebes that breed in the UK. Slavonian grebe and black neck grebe are the other two. We occasionally get red neck grebes um, breeding in Scotland, um, but uh, in the home counties, the only grebes that you're most likely to see this time of year um, are the little grebe and the uh, great crested grebe. These are also the grebes you're potentially, you hear these a lot more than you see them. Um, they are skulking around on reed edges, um, but uh, what you might hear is the trilling uh, that the little grebes make. Um, and they also make that sound uh, while they're, um, they also make that sound when they're flying over at night. So um, grebes, uh, little grebes especially, uh, fly around um, in, the, uh, in the middle of the night, two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning. And quite often anyone with their the NOCMIG, the nocturnal migration, uh, take recorders outside, um, will be hearing the uh, you know the little grebes making their sort of trilling noise as they fly over the uh, the, the house. Um, Susan is talking about the the squawks of the baby great crested grebes. Yeah, they are. They can be very uh, very loud. And the great crested grebes as well. They got that. Yeah. Um, you've probably seen the pictures of the little babies on the back of the great crested grebes. Um, to my knowledge, and Dave's going to uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, I don't think little grebes do that. I don't think they have the babies on the back. I think by the time the little grebe chicks are that big, I think they're, they're, they're almost as big as the little grebes. But I'm, um, I'm, I'm, my knowledge of little grebe chicks on backs isn't as uh, isn't as thing. What I'm hoping for is Dave in the background is going to be Googling that and find an image of one. Um, but... Um, to my knowledge, they don't. But hey, we'll uh, we'll find out in about five minutes when when Dave's done the homework. Um, so little grebe, we're hopefully looking for, and as you can see, they're lovely, beautiful, lovely rufous cheek. Um, sometimes we, you know, beginners do mistake them for black neck grebes because they've got that sort of black. Um, but again, that orange cheek is what sets them apart, and their size. They are small. Um, they are smaller than moor hens. They are one of our uh, our smallest water birds um, that we have. I included these two as typically we oh. see birds in the um, uh, in uh, in the winter time, and for the most part, pochards have normally uh, disappeared. However, in recent years, certainly on some of the Bucks waters, Willem Lake, and uh, I think uh, a couple of years ago, Western Turville, you do get ones or twos of these pot charts hanging around. There we go. Little grebes do carry their young on their backs. I'm sure they're very, very cute as well. Um, there's a, 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 another tick into my knowledge there of little grebes. I've never knowingly seen little grebes on the back. So um there we go maybe maybe all grebes do it and we need to we need to check all the grebes now um dave is it uh every grebe is is that a, is that a unique to grebes we even we're finding out stuff tonight um so we might be lucky enough to see a pochard all of these birds i put up tonight from the the duck side of the world are all resplendent in their breeding plumage 
we're now starting to see some of those ducks go into um, uh, what we call the starting of eclipse, which means they're starting to sort of molt out some of those summer feathers. So we haven't gone down that that uh, identification route of what birds look like when they're not out there sparkling in summer plumages, um, but uh, maybe maybe another identification feature for next year. So pochards are the diving ducks, um, and there's two different types of ducks really, the diving ducks and the dabblers. Um, now, widgeons are actually a little bit between the two. They are very much a dabbling duck, and when we talk about dabbling, they're the ones that stay on the surface and reach down and grab all the weeds, etc. But as you can see here, widging are typically um, uh, love feeding on grass and they're out of the water. Obviously, they will. They, they are at home on the water, but for the most, most time during the winter. The reason I included widging, again, is because even though most of these are breeding in uh, sort of Norway and Scandinavia, maybe northern Scotland, um, we do get ones or twos that over summer. And uh, certainly College Lake is a really good place to we get these uh, these ducks over over summering. There's currently one at uh, Limford Lakes in Milton Keynes as well. The ubiquitous mallard. What can we say about the mallard? It's, everybody knows the mallards, they're common. But what you probably don't know is just how vicious and cruel mallards are. Um, and as we say, I, I, I think Dave and I over the last couple of years have made everyone really not like dunnocks because of their penchant for um, uh, sort of attacking other dunnocks, rape, incest, all of that sort of uh, things that go on in the hidden world of the dunnocks. Uh, well, unfortunately, uh, the mallards are of that ilk as well, not necessarily so much on the, uh, uh, on the, um, uh, the, the killing, but you will notice, especially in the last couple of weeks, there's been flocks of mallards sort of flying around, calling, squawking, look like they're chasing each other. It's mostly four or five males chasing a single female mallard. And the idea is they sort of, they tire her out. Um, she crash lands on the lake and then they all jump on top of her. Um, and obviously the most successful uh, is the one that, that gets, to, uh, gets to, to mate with her. And then typically that mating will, will, will carry on. Unfortunately, having four big burly mallards on you in a water-based environment does mean that sometimes you drown. Um, so again, it's um, not that I want to put you off feeding the uh, feeding the ducks, but uh, you know sometimes in their in their over eagerness to uh, further the species, male mallards are quite nasty. Um, but again, we should see quite a few of this, and we're hoping uh, everybody um, uh, favourite. We're hoping to see some little fluffy ducklings as well. So um, uh, if there's a, if there's a, if there's any any uh, deity out there looking down on us from the birding gods, um, we should see some little fluffy ducklings on Saturday as well. Another one that might be quite familiar to you: the tufted duck. Um, tufted ducks again, another diving duck. And I don't know if you can sort of um, uh, sort of see the the shapes effectively. So the diving ducks, which is potchard and tufted duck, quite squat, sort of rounded birds. Whereas the dabbling ducks, the widgeons, the mallards, they tend to be a lot straighter, a lot flatter in the water. So what they need, they need the length. They need the length to be able to get down and get the weeds. Whereas the tufted ducks, the potchards, and, and the gold, we're not all looking at golden eye, but the other diving ducks tend to have this sort of squat body shape. Um, obviously, again, like in the uh, the real world, what, you know, we we pretty much name everything after the male. Um, so the, even though it's a uh, uh, the tuft is mostly on the male, there's that little bump on the back of the head as a female, there's a little, a little nod um, to the tuftiness of, of it as well. Um, typically black and white, although when you see that head shape in the bright sunshine, you get the purple and the green sort of coming through. So we hopefully see quite a few tufted ducks on Saturday as well. Um, another dabbler and one that a lot of people mistake for the uh, for the mallard is the gadwell. Um, the male, I think, is one of the most beautiful ducks, especially in that full sunlight with that grey plumage with those little... Um, uh, brown sort of plumes that are cascading down uh, from their back there. And although the female gadwell does superficially look like a female mallard, um, look at the bill. Look at the bill, the size, the, the size of the head, 
Um, and just look at that sort of coloration. It's much more subtle on the uh, on the Gadwell. Only the base or the lower half of the base of the bill is orange, and it's a much more subdued, smaller uh, bird as well. And then we've got the shoveler. These are a, a, a firm favourite of the uh, of the bird in uh, uh, the sort of uh, duck watcher. Um, they're called the shoveler because they they have a shovel like bill. You've got the male on the left there, resplendent its green head, and you've got the female on the right. Now, again, I'm not sure if they actually breed at College Lake, but you're, they're quite often seen into late May, early June. We do have a couple of pairs in the uh, in that sort of county and surrounding counties. Again, very, um, very occasional breeders locally. Um, again, they tend to feed on the surface and do and dip down to to pick out those reeds as well. Another one of the uh, Dublin duck family. And to complete our suite of ducks um, is the till, the male bird there on the right with that lovely resplendent green um, supercilia there, and that lovely sort of white stripe down the um, down the uh, horizontally along the wing there. Female on the left, again, complete opposite to, uh, to to humans, where the ladies are the loveliest uh, looking. In the duck world, very much subdued because they're the ones on the nest. They're the ones that where the sparrowhawks and the uh, uh, the foxes are trying to uh, you know uh, are overlooking because of they're the same colour as the reeds or they're the same colour as the um, as the the surrounding vegetation. But that's the only reason. Otherwise, all the gaudy males would, uh, would would get snapped up by the foxes fairly quickly. And um, well, hopefully, we'll see a few teal um, on Saturday as well. Uh, again, they're a, they're a very scarce breeder uh, in the county. But um, as far as I, I can tell, I remember I think there's at least one pair that uh, typically uh, summers and potentially um, produces young at, uh, at College Lake as well. So those are the ducks. So if you've got any duck related questions, um, please pop them in the chat. Um, the next two slides, I'm, I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on. Uh, these are the ubiquitous geese, Canada geese and grey lag goose. Um, for the most part, you um, unless um, maybe you don't know, but the UK list is split into three or four. Have you got something to say, Dave? No, no, no. Sorry, you came off a mute. Um, oh, yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> no, no, carry on. I thought you had a Canada goose fact there. We're going to throw in. <laughs> um, uh, there's, there's four, there's actually five different categories of the British list. And um, there's category A, category B, and category C. And category C is where we classify um, all the species that are introduced into the UK. Um, and Canada geese were introduced in the UK. The neck flu is in the name, they normally in uh, Canada. Um, but most of the geese, the grey leg geese that we see locally are also introduced as well. Very much a wild fowler's favourite, although in Northern Scotland, Ireland, and some of the uh, uh, sort of um, Western Isles, we still get uh, pure uh, grey lag geese coming in for the winter from uh, from Scandinavia and uh, and, um, and other northerly climes. Um, we should see both of these at uh, College Lake on Saturday, and again there should be a healthy dose of uh, fluffy goslings um, to be able to see. So we're hoping for see some ducklings and some goslings. Um, again, the next two species you should be relatively familiar with. Uh, the coot and the moorhen. Um, the best way to tell them apart, well, you know, we've heard the saying as bald as a coot, uh, has that big white facial patch and gleaming red eye, and the moorhen has that sort of red facial patch with that yellow tipped beak as well. What you'll also know, oops, I'm getting ahead of myself there. What you'll also notice there is the um, the all black plumage of the coot actually goes quite grey on its back. And actually, the subtlety within the moorhen is that the, the wings are typically black, but they have that lovely bluish sheen um, at the front there. Um, you also might, uh, the, the, the diving styles of the, of the two are very different. Coop's very much a, a bottom feeder um, and will sort of uh, just bob down where it is in the middle of the water, whereas moorhen's much uh, a bird of reed beds and feeding on the edges and around lakes. And they'll have that lovely dainty 
sort of almost rocking horse motion as they swim across the uh, as they swim across the lake. So even though uh, very closely related, completely different feeding styles and habits. So coots and moorhens, and uh, if we're very lucky, we might see a coot out of the water. And we can all look at its lobed feet. I, I should have put in a picture of its lobed feet. So uh, coots have these fantastic blue, just like the best way to describe them. They're just like big clumps of um, of jelly uh, for their for their toes. And you think, wow, how how do they actually um, walk on them? Well, they don't spend a lot of time uh, off of or out of um, out of the water. So these their their feet are really built for plowing through the water and uh, catching those small fishes and uh, uh, and insects under the water. We're also hopefully going to be seeing a couple of these grey herons. Uh, we're starting to see quite a few of the young birds coming out now. I don't believe, from what I can remember, I don't think there's a heronry at uh, College Lake, uh, but there is a few heronries nearby at Tring Reservoirs, so they'll be coming in potentially the young birds to, to feed into, into college. Um, we should also hopefully come across uh, one of these, little egret. Um, again, they do breed uh, nearby Tring Reservoirs. Little egret has had a huge explosion um, over the last uh, last couple of years, so in, certainly in breeding terms in the, in, in the county. Uh, I think they're now, I write, I write Little Egrets up for the county report. So I think they're now breeding at sort of five locations uh, in Bucks, which is just incredible. Bearing in mind, uh, even as recent as you know, 1990, 1991, uh, people like myself were herring around the country um, to try and get a glimpse of, of a little egret. Um, I twitched one on Portland, uh, of all places, and they now breed less than a mile from my house. So uh, uh, times we, you know, we're seeing sort of declines in certain species, but certain other species like little egrets are, are certainly on the uh, on the rise. And the last bird from me, because uh, I'll be handed over to my uh, erstwhile colleague in a couple of moments, um, is the cormorant. Now, for those of you who've had a nice summer holiday near the coast, you might have seen shags um, and cormorants. They, they're the ones that collectively um, on the uh, on the coastal areas. But inland, the, although shags do occur inland, you're most likely to see a cormorant. These are the ones that the prehistoric looking birds that you might see perched up on uh, pylons or on tops of trees or logs in the middle of the reservoir and they're drying their wings um so uh we should uh we should see a cormorant i'm just now 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 i'm thinking about it dave i'm just like yeah the, yeah we, we, we it depends if they it depends if they're flying over i'm not sure how often they uh they drop down onto college i think i think you get them at the back of the big big pool yeah they do on, on, rest on up there the, don't they yeah, I think they're on the um the raft and on, along that bit of coast, a little bit of shoreline. I think they they tend to uh, congregate, so we should see them. Oh, brilliant! I was just yeah, just I was thinking, I was like, oh, right, <laughs> have, I over, have I over egged the pudding a little bit too much? And uh, <laughs> we're promising all this stuff that me and Dave have now got to deliver. <laughs> um, so that's the that's the end of I guess the water birds. Um, some of the ducks we should hopefully like to see. And as you might um, uh, you might imagine, we haven't really covered these on the identification features because for the most part, you're not going to see them on your Chiltern farms. Um, you might get the occasional mallard or cormorant flying over, um, but hopefully we'll, uh, we'll open your mind and, uh, and uh, your, uh, your eyes to the beauty of some of these birds on Saturday. Over to you, Mr. Ooh. P. All right, lovely. Thank you, Simon. That's a great introduction. I'm just going to share my screen now. Hopefully, I can everything set up. Uh, there we go. So, share Should sound. Share sound. Optimize the video. Everybody can just say that you, you can hear me. That'll be good. So, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Excellent. And you, can you see the screen? Some other species to look for on Saturday. Yes. And over the next few weeks. Brilliant. OK, we're going to rattle through, as, as Simon said, we're, you know, we're not into going through the finer identification details of, of all of these species. But really, just to put in your minds um, some of the species to, to start looking out for, um, you know, we're only in um, the beginning of June. 
but already the first um, waders uh, are starting to return from the north, which will probably probably some of them will be failed breeders or um, the first time that they've they've migrated north and um, found where they're where they're going to be breeding once they're sort of sexually mature, and now they're already sort of returning back on, on their way to Africa. So uh, you know, autumn autumn in that respect has started for for some species. So uh, don't be surprised if we we get the odd surprise perhaps on Saturday if we're lucky but if not then you're going to some of the reservoirs or or lakes um, around Bucks and Oxford and so on over the next few weeks then uh, we might sort of luck out and luck in and, and um, see some some nice birds so let's have a look at um, what we might get so let me, uh, let me go next slide. okay so let's start off with a goodie um, strange as it may seem, there is uh, there has been a, an osprey around in the north of the county um, over the last few weeks. Whether that's a, a, a summering individual bird um, or it's a, a, a sort of a second year on its in its first uh, first foray north, hasn't quite made it to Scotland, or whether it's something from one of the um, the Leicestershire. Um, introduction scheme and they're starting to expand their range who knows but um, just keep your eyes on, on the skies you never know what uh, what we might find um, when you see a, a big almost like a sort of an immature gull with that brown back and the pale underparts but if it starts hovering over the water um, then and you can see the uh, the black carpal joints underneath the gleaming white breast and, and the, the, the black on the head then uh, you found yourself an osprey. So uh, bucks can be can be quite good in the autumn. You can often get one that will, um, on its way south, will stop um, stop over at one of the reservoirs and can hang about for you know two, three, four days sometimes. So uh, um, we'll put some some news out if anything like that turns up and uh, give you give you a chance to sort of move move over to a reservoir and, and perhaps see something uh, something really spectacular. If you see one fishing. Um, one of the birds that we might get um, on Saturday at uh, at college, um, they certainly um, several birds um, can be seen at, at Wilston during the course of the summer and in the autumn is the hobby. So this is a slightly smaller cousin to the kestrel, um, feeds on dragonflies predominantly um, and depending on on the weather um, will depend on how high the dragonflies are flying and therefore how fly, how high the hobbies are flying as well. Um, so if we're if we're lucky um, and it starts to sort of cloud up, um, then that might bring the dragonflies back down and we might be might be treated to the sight of a hobby uh, scything through the air and, uh, and catching some dragonflies. And on that note, one of the things that we should be keeping an eye out for on, on Saturday as well is, the number of dragonflies that um, that hopefully we can see at the college as well they do get some get some good numbers and some good species there so typically with the hobby um it looks it looks more swift like um than the kestrel slightly smaller um slightly sort of more paired back wings narrower wings um if you get a good view uh, of an adult you can you can see the uh, the red trousers and the, the red undertail covers there um, it's too early for, for the, the juveniles at the moment, but they'll be around in, in say, a uh, month, month and a half or so. They'll start to uh, to take the wing. So there's an outside chance, but um, they're getting, uh, they're another species that uh, that seems to be on the increase. Um, so uh, autumn is a good time to uh, to check out Hobby at one of the local reservoirs. Um, something that we've, we've, we have covered um, in the past, in the, one of the previous sessions, um, obviously reed bunting, uh, which is one of the species that uh, that does flock up in the winter at some of the feeding stations, uh, with its cousins the yellowhammer and the corn bunting, um, and then also the the reed and the sedge warblers. And we'll keep an eye out for both reed and sedge um, on Saturday. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to compare and contrast the uh, the two species. Um, but you know, if you look at the uh, the picture there, the reed warbler on the top, fairly plain brown above, um, from colourless above, uh, and buffy um, moving to white under on the underparts, 
um, long dagger-like bill tends to stick more in the, the reeds. Uh, and then the sedge warbler, which tends to be sort of slightly more patterned around the head with that, that big creamy white eye stripe, um, with the cover the bordered by black above and, and below, uh, and more, more, more black on the, um, the scapulars and, and the coverts and, and the primaries. Um, but uh, they tend to be in the reeds, but also in, in some of the bushes and the sedges alongside the reed bed. So hopefully we'll be able to pick out both of those and, and as I say, compare and contrast. And um, reed bunting, we'll have a keep, keep a good eye out and an ear out for those as well, because uh, hopefully we should hear them singing um, around the marsh uh, and be able to get some good views of, of those species. So put those on your, your list of uh, things to look out for. A um, couple of others, perhaps not going to be um, um, around the, at college on, on the weekend, but um, something else to, to think about. Um, over the course of the next few weeks, uh, meadow pipits and, and yellow wagtails as they, they start to move um, south um, in for the autumn. And yellow, uh, yellow wagtails, unmistakable in their sort of adult plumage, being bright yellow below and pretty yellowish on, on the top. But the juveniles can be a um, bit, bit paler underneath and, and, and much, much less well, well colored on, on above. And one of the song, one of the sounds to uh, to listen out for uh, when they're flying around is this lovely little whistle that they give. And if you're lucky and you get a flock of these together and they all they all take off, um, then uh, it, it sounds really nice. And one of the common areas that you can find these is in meadows with um, where cows are grazing. They do love. Um, walking around um, uh, with the cows and picking off the insects um, from around the cows and so on. So meadow pipit, um, again, you know, we've seen them on, on Ivinghoe, not too far away. Probably won't see them on, on Saturday, but again, another species that will be starting to, to, to move south. Um, now, three species um, that, 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 that ostensibly sort of fairly similar, but they certainly share the sort of the same sort of habitat on their on their on their way south. The stone chat, um, the wind chat and, and the wheat ear. Now we've we've seen wheat ears this spring um, at Ivinghoe. Um, the ones that we'll, we'll see most of as they move south um, will be the sort of the, the more sandy brown um, colour rather than the, uh, the, the the contrasting adults that we saw in the spring. Um, but obviously the white rump when they when they fly off um, gives them away. Um, and stone chat and wind chat, which are two similar species, um, they'll start to uh, to occur fairly soon. Um, stone chat has that um, uh, sort of peachy underparts and black head, and it's got this sort of white half collar um, in the spring. Less obvious in in the autumn, especially in the uh, in the, the the juveniles in the in the uh, in the autumn, um, so they can look um, fairly similar to wind chats, but wind chats are slightly bigger, and they always tend to have this uh, this pale, buffy eye stripe in in the autumn. Um, but similar similar species, but well worth looking out for as both both species tend to uh, to perch up high on uh, on um, you know some of the uh, the, the short bushes uh, and some of the uh, taller shrubs that, uh, that uh, we do get um, in the county. Um, and a couple of other species. Um, now spotted flycatchers um, seem to have been in sort of fairly short supply in, in the county this year, um, but we should start to see um, juveniles in sort of late July um, starting to appear hopefully. Um, Chardelos is a, is a good site for, for seeing those. Here in the park um, is normally a good site for seeing them, but unfortunately I haven't seen any there um, so far this year. But there are odd, odd pairs that have been seen around the county, so hopefully yeah, um, we, should, um, we should be able to see those in sort of late July. Um, the species that seems to be doing quite well in certain parts of Wales at the moment, um, with the good weather that they've been having there, is the pipe flycatcher. 
Um, now this is this is uh, quite a rarity within um, bucks, but if they're having a good year in in uh, Wales, then we, we can hope that um, we might get the odd one or two appear in uh, somewhere in, in Buckinghamshire. Very very white on the underparts when you see them from below. Tend to sit like a flycatcher. Will tend to sit still uh, and wait and, and dart out, pick out a fly, fly back to a, a perch and sit there and, and devour it. Uh, and start looking for the next one. Um, but if you can see the sides of the, uh, the the bird, then you'll see these these big white um, wing panels. Um, so on the uh, on the autumn birds on the left hand side there, uh, where it's an adult bird, you can see that there's that big white patch there, uh, like against the brown back, um, is a is a is a dead giveaway for uh, for those. And again, you know if um, if some of those darts turn up, and we'll, we'll put some we'll put some information out on the uh, tracking the impact group for everybody to uh, to have a look at. Um, hang on a minute, that's not quite right. Where's the rest of them gone? I've lost some species, Simon. Where are we? Oh no, here we go. Right, here's the ones I meant to start with. Okay. So the waders that we might get lucky with. Um, so when I started off, I was saying that um, some of the some of the wader species are starting to move south. Um, obviously, um, some of them we do get some um, little ringed plovers um, that do breed in the county. Um, I don't know whether there's any breeding at um, at College Lake. Um, at the moment, but there, there may well be uh, a pair or two, so we might get lucky and, and be able to pick up those. Um, and the comparison against the, the ringed plover, which is can be sort of slightly larger, is that the little ringed plover, when you see it in flight, does not have a wing bar, whereas the ringed plover does have a very obvious and long wing bar that stretches from the body to the uh, uh, the edge of the wing. Uh, but if you see them wandering around um, on the shore, on the mud, then look for the white behind the black line that goes all the way across the top of the forehead and the yellow eye ring around here and yellower legs. Um, whereas the ringed plover tends to have orange, more orange legs, doesn't have the white line behind the, uh, the black here going across the top of the head. Um, and um, uh, doesn't have the uh, the, the, the yellow wing, uh, the yellow eye ring. Um, obviously, if you can pick up the the orange on the the, the adult of a, a, a ringed plover, then that's obviously a dead giveaway as well, because the uh, the ring the little ringed plover has a, a dark bill. But we'll if hopefully we can get um, get a view of one or more of those um, over on Saturday, and we can go through some of the finer finer points while we're while we're doing that. Um. I thought I'd put this one in because Dunlin really is um, one of the, the, the commoner waders, one of the more likely that's um, going to turn up in land, and one of the ones that you're likely to see more of when you're uh, when you're, if you're visiting the coast and um, uh, looking at um, shore birds which might pitch up on the beach or on the on the estuary that uh, that you might be visiting. And the one thing about Dunlin is that they are. They are very variable. If you look at look at that mix of plumages there, um, you've got obviously the bottom right. You've got um, an adult bird in, in summer plumage, um, which you can get um, all the way into into July sometimes. But equally on on the bottom on the top, sorry the, the far left here, you've got the juvenile, and it can be um, you know it's it's spotty bits on the underparts it's it's sort of got some pattern on the upper parts um and it sort of can be slightly sort of gingery brownie around around the face medium sort of length bill slightly droopy um black legs but uh, if you if you compare that with the adult in the winter in the middle it you know it's it looks like a completely different species you've got the gray gray back paler underparts very little spotting um but you know, and you can get a mixture of all the plumages in, in between. So they are a bird to, uh, they are one of the birds, the wader species to get to know 
because if you can eliminate Dunlin from what you're looking at, then you can you know that it's going to be something uh, something quite interesting. So this is the call of the Dunlin in flight. Quite distinct. And it's one of the good things about the uh, the wader group is that they do make they do make noise when they fly off. Um, they'll invariably call. Um, if if the if if, if a wader species flies off and doesn't call, then that can be in itself it can be an indicator that you could be uh, looking at something quite interesting. Um, well, I've grouped these three together. Um, these are three that can be can be confused. Um, likely to be found in inland as much as uh, on the coast, uh, lakes, rivers, um, estuaries, and so on. Um, so we have the, the wood sandpiper, which is the, the rarest of the three, uh, the green sandpiper, uh, and the common sandpiper. So starting with the common sandpiper in the bottom left here, um, this is a bird um, that you'll see bobbing along um, on the uh, on the edge of the the shore, um, it literally does bob almost like a sort of a wagtail bobs, um, and that's uh, quite a, a distinctive um, uh, pointer for common sandpiper. Very white underparts, greyish sort of breast. But the thing to look for to to separate from common sandpiper from green sandpiper is this notch. Um, that, that is just uh, on the, the in front of the bend of the wing. So this is on the uh, the body of the bird. And if you look at the green sandpiper on the right, you see that the the, the breast line comes all, all the way down, forms quite a nice sort of um, breast marking. Um, but there's no there's no notch uh, or white that appears there at all. And you know, it, you look at the pictures there and you think, oh, well, yes, yeah, you can see that you can see the difference is quite easy, but if, if a bird's a hundred yards away on the shoreline on the other side of, of a reservoir or on the other side of a pond or something, um, it can be more difficult to pick up uh, the differences between the species. Um, the other thing is, is to look at when the, when the species um, fly. So with common sandpiper, they have a, a brown rump. They have a, a wing bar that doesn't stretch all the way down to the, the edge of the wing, but starts from the body. And they have a very... Um, um, very interesting flight. It's sort of like um, it's sort of like they flit um, four or five times uh, and then uh, just fly for a little bit and then start fitting again. So just letting the dog out the, the room. Um, it's quite a quite a, a unique um, flight pattern. Um, whereas the green sandpiper, all dark upper parts um, across the wings, no wing bars at all. But has a white rump, uh, and then has a sort of uh, a barred uh, tail uh, element, which the uh, the common sandpiper doesn't have. Um, wood sandpiper um, on the left here, the juveniles, which will be the ones that you tend to tend to see, quite spotty on the back, um, nice long white uh, eye stripe. Uh, yellowish legs tend to be sort of slightly longer leg than uh, green sandpiper and certainly common sandpiper. Um, and then sort of don't have an obvious bib, but they do have spotting, faint spotting that goes down um, towards the uh, towards the belly. Um, but again, because uh, because waders are, are, are well trained, they do tend to let us know who they are by the, the voices that they make. So this is the wood sandpiper. This is the green sandpiper. Very different. Very obvious. And then we have the uh, common sandpiper coming in. This is the common sand. So very again similar in some sort of sort of tone, but um, but very different um, from from the other. So we put them all together. And 
uh, that would be a real treat to be able to hear all of those three species together um, somewhere in the back of the other than the next few weeks. Okay, so that's um, two of the larger, slightly larger waders, um, which you should be pretty familiar with. We might see um, red shank on Saturday. Uh, I think there's a, a breeding pair there at the moment, at least one breeding pair. I think they might have young. Um, so red shank and green shank, and shank being the old name for, for legs, gives you a clue as to uh, where they get their, uh, their name from. So red shank, um, nice. Um, spotty underparts in the summer for the adults, dark abyss on the back, reddish bill, and quite uh, reddy orangey uh, legs. Uh, in flight, you see this white going right up the back, and uh, a barred tail, and the long legs extending beyond the uh, the tail there. Um, green shank is larger, um, has the greener legs as you'd expect, um, has a a longer bill, slightly upturned, um, greyer bill, and tends to be a greyer bird overall. Um, and then when you see it in flight, has this again has the big uh, white wedge going up the the back, but has more white um, around the tail um, compared with uh, the, the red shank. And um, just to play the sounds of each. Sorry for that. A very common sound on, on the coast and on the estuaries um, for a common red shank. Red shank you can tend to see in, in, in groups as well, whereas green shank do tend to be sort of um, a more solitary bird. Um, So worth getting to know these calls. They're not. Uh, they're, they are. They do have their similarities. Um, with a bit of practice, you can you can tell them apart um, quite easily. So yeah. So we should uh, we should see uh, red shank at the weekend. Uh, another bird that we probably won't see, but won't be, won't be long before it's um, returning to the reed beds um, and the uh, and the marshes um, is the the common snipe. Um, again. Um, sometimes not very easy to see uh, unless you sort of virtually tread on them and, and they fly away, um, falling and that sort of noise. Um, but yeah, stripey on the back, um, down the uh, down the the back there, uh, very stripey around the head, long bill. Um, don't always tend to sit up very high on, on the legs, you know, they'll tend to be either in the water with the, most of the legs covered or they'll sort of be crouching down um, while they're feeding and very unobtrusive a, a lot of the time. Winter is the best time um, to see them, um, but um, they will be, will be returning um, fairly soon. So with a bit of luck, you might see one, but uh, maybe maybe a bit earlier. So that's um, that's the species that we're likely to uh, well keep an eye out for over the next few weeks. Hopefully there'll be some other things, and I'll hand back to Simon um, to, uh, to pick, kick us off on his um, on his quiz. Hello, Simon. Hello. Trying to unmute myself. <laughs> <laughs> Do you um? If, do you want to stop sharing, Dave, and I'll um I'll share over um. Did, yeah. Did, did, yeah. I'm just. Uh, yeah. uh, it's like it's like seamless. It's like we've 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 we've, we've done. Almost like we practiced it. We almost like we practiced it. <laughs> right. Okay. Are you all ready for the quiz? Um. Obviously, your your mind's completely blown with all the exciting stuff that we're going to get on uh, on Saturday. Um. But we thought it's the end of the um. It's the end of the 
uh, of certainly, uh, you know, Dave and Maya's uh, tenure. Obviously, we've got the WhatsApp groups, which are still going really well. Um, don't worry, you won't be oisted out of the bird skills one. So uh, you can still uh, you can still get hold of me and Dave personally. And obviously, we've got the main track in the impact uh, WhatsApp group as well. But what we felt was um, it's, uh, you know, as we as you are, you've uh, you've, you've had mine and Dave's uh, vast experience out in the field. We've done everything we can. Uh, to make you uh, to make you as uh, as independent as possible, and uh, we're not we're not here to show anyone up. So what I'm just about to do is, I the the messaging now is um, is set or should be set that um, all you can chat with is me and Dave. Okay, um, so your chat is not going to go anywhere else. If anyone wants to test that for me very quickly. Um, on the on the sort of just type yourself a message uh, just see if that just comes to me and Dave I'm, uh, I'm, I'm intrigued just type a message into the chat um, it would have ordinarily gone to everyone I just I've changed the setting I just want to make sure that it actually um, um, actually works hey look Tim's well up for it uh, um, for those of you who can't see actually it's just come to me and Dave Tim has just gone quiz time I think Tim's at the back there. He's got his Merlin app open. Uh, he's got his Collins guide. He's got two screens on the go. Um, and he's ready, ready with his Google fingers. Um, we're hoping that this isn't uh, isn't too much of a, uh, of a chore for you guys. These are all species that we have seen. <laughs> I don't know if that's <laughs> just... Mark's just replied. I think that was, I don't know if that's me or you, Dave. I don't know if he's a... Uh, he's, uh, he directed that particular uh, that particular um, answer to I'm, there. Um, I'm, I'm I can't I can't see any of the uh, the messages. I you think you need to make oh, me a co-host oh, oh, again? Oh, oh to, I do apologise, Dave. Hold no, on no worries. I can imagine. I can imagine if it's Mark, it's something to do with yellow hammers and kestrel. Um, is that? It, 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 it's just it's just put a species down. He's actually uh, now now it's me. Um, he was uh, the species he uh, he said to. Yeah, I don't know, Dave. Why you can't see it? It's very odd. Um, I'll set it to. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, you're, I've, I've set it to host and co-hosts. But anyway, um, oh, anyway, okay. he's called you a great fit and yeah, you're you're right. bearded, yeah. So um, <laughs> there we, there we that's, that's nice. the level of Mark's humour well, there. In that um, case, well, in that I'm, case, I'm, in that case, I'm definitely going to tell the Kestrel and the Yellowhammer story. <laughs> So um, here we go. It's uh, it's not too onerous, but what I'd like to do is I'm, are you, you're going to you're going to get a chance to examine your screen there, and then the reason we've we've turned the chat off is just in case you do identify um, a a yellow hammer. Uh, oh, oh, actually, oh, you can choose who to send the message to, either you or Dave. Oh, there we go. There oh, we right, go. There you go. Awesome. Feel free, feel free, send some to Dave. Or, you know, I, I, I don't care. <laughs> um, what do you think number one is? Okay, you can send this to Dave or you can send this to me. Um, the only reason we're not doing it out of front of everyone is if suddenly you sort of, you put in, you know, it's a carrion crow. Um, oh, look at that. I don't know what, what you've got, Dave, but I, I've got correct answers coming through like nobody's <laughs> business here. No, no, I'm barely, no, I'm barely no mates. That's all right. It's probably just easier to send it to me. Yeah. Well, I'm, what I'm going to do, Dave, Dave, everyone's got it correct. If you'd Excellent. like to reveal what species number one is. Well, you want me to identify it? I, I, so. Yeah, yeah. This is, this is as much a quiz <laughs> for Dave as it is for anyone else. Well, I have to say it must be a blackbird. It must be a blackbird. So the other thing that Dave's going to give us an overview is what? Why is this a blackbird, Dave? What are we? Uh, what are we looking at there? So we're looking at. Uh, um, well, difficult to tell the size, obviously, from that photograph. But the the black plumage, um, the yellow eye ring, and the all yellow beak, um, would, and the shape would uh, tend to say that you're looking at something in the thrush family, and therefore it must be the. Uh, must be the blackbird from the plumage details. There the we go. Details. go. Thank you so much, Dave. So number one, blackbird. Um, very much a uh, species. I think we've seen on every. In fact, I think most of these we've seen on every uh, on every session. Okay, number two. Who's going to be fastest finger? 
There's a, a, someone, someone, there's normally someone who's already written the answer. And it, oh, there we go. Look, at, I told you, Tim's got his app. He's got his apps up there. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. T T Tessa, I love your answer there. And there's, there's people now doing just uh, just little small bits of code just to get the, the species over the line there. I love it. Um, we've got all right answers so far. A couple of people still to put in before we reveal. And you know what? If if for you, um... <laughs> sorry, no worries. Uh, Mark's on his phone. He's got back in it, so he's having a peer on his phone, and he's still got the uh, he's still got Blackbird right. Um, okay, any oh, last got... any last guesses for number two? Yeah, I've got I've got one uh, I've got one answer which is correct. Sarah and David. Right. I'll, oh, um, I'll take Sarah's. I'll take the mantle on this. Oh, unless you want, do you want to have a guess on this one, Dave? No, no, as well. Just Sarah and David have, have moved on to number three already, so uh, we we'll get oh, a okay. move on. So, <laughs> so number number two. If you look at the uh, the head and the very small bill, quite a large eye, and then you look at the back of the neck, you can see just a bit of a collar there, pale sort of um, browny buffy plumage, slightly long tail. Um, and that is the uh, um, all adds up to uh, a collared dove. Brilliant, thanks, Dave. So, so far, we've got a black bird that's black and it's a bird, we've got a <laughs> bird with a collar that's a dove, so it's collared dove, and now we've got, I think, pink breasted, blue headed bird. Is that is that correct? Or give us your answer. What do we think? Number three is you've actually got the male in the foreground. Oh look! Oh, there's some there's some fast fingers oh, well, going now. Well, I already had the I already had the answer from Sarah and David before before we even got there. Big, big, in a minute, people are just going to type all the answers and just they're <laughs> going to type just all the answers type, just, type just type them in. All, just type all fifteen in. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, number so, three is of course. It is of course a finch, and uh, with the the blue. On the head and the uh, the the brick red underparts and sides of the face and those large white wing patches, it must be a chaffinch. Must be a chaffinch. I tell you what I'm going to do because uh, in the expedience of time and people wanting to eat their dinner, um, I'm going to I'm going <laughs> to do four and five together. Okay, and we're going to give you a bit of a clue. There's some colours involved. Okay, so I want to know number four and number <laughs> five. So two species of birds, and to give you a little bit of a hint. They might be of the same family as the one you just guessed. Look at that. Dave, we've done some good work this year, mate. We are, we are, we are getting we are getting perfect answers yeah, um, yeah. across the board. Excellent. What have we got, Dave? Even though even though number four is in flight, we've got uh, got correct answers as to it's the um the goldfinch. With those big white uh, undertail patches, there. It's not a, an American wood warbler, which uh, <laughs> you could be thinking about, but it's got that uh, beautiful white bill, red forehead and chin, black eye surround, and black on the back of the head. And obviously, although even though you can't see the, the pattern on the wing, it is a goldfinch. Number five. Number five is the uh, slightly more grumpy version of the uh, the goldfinch. Not quite so so pretty, but um, equally uh, the wings can be quite colourful when they're spread. But uh, there's just a hint of that um, nice colour that you can see along the wing edge there, being green and uh, of the same family as the one before. It uh, it is our green finch. Wonderful. It's uh, yeah and. Uh... Guessed by everyone, not guessed, correctly identified by everyone. Correctly so, identified, exactly. No guessing yeah. here. <laughs> um, and there you go. So that top line, left to right, blackbird, collared dove, chaffinch, goldfinch, greenfinch. Oh, oh, do you know what? Susie's just must just step to march. We've we are gonna we're gonna identify six, seven, eight all at once. Okay. I just want three words from you. Because again, they're all of the same uh, family. Six, seven, and eight. What what have we got? Susie's off the off the scale on this one. <gasps> there yeah. we go. All right, Sarah all and David. Right so far. Yep, Sarah mm. and David, correct. Double points as, to as, Tessa. 
as we would expect. Well, T Tessa, Tessa wrote down Tessa wrote down the full names as well, rather than just the three first bits. Excellent. And if you and if you put the Latin names as well, you get bonus points and an extra piece of cake on Saturday. Um, I'm, I'm I'm not going to claim the cake then. Um, oh, I've you know, no, just, just I've just remembered one of them. I'm I'm I'm, I'm struggling on number eight, but I'm so, I'm sure it's um, oh no no I've just remembered number eight as well. No, it's, uh, yeah. Okay, take take us through our tits then, Dave. Right. So on the left hand side, with the uh, even though you can't see the size difference between any of these three species. Um, looking at the, the one on the left, big white cheeks, surrounded by black, um, yellow underparts, but a, a nice thick black band running down the, the center of the chest onto the underparts. Um, then that uh, tells you that you're looking at a great tit and probably a male with the thinness of the, uh, the black line, just to go one step further. Um, and then the next one to it, um, obviously still got a white face, but uh, black line through the eye and a blue top to the, the head, which gives us a clue that uh, this is, uh, look, we're looking at a, a blue tit here. Uh, and then number eight, um, very different um, um, tit in terms of its habits and uh, where you'll find it. Um, but the uh, the black head, black top to the head, white cheeks. You can just see the white, the black bib on that. But the the giveaway here is the slightly double wing bar, pale wing bar, but also the white blaze down the, the back of the head, um, which tells us that we must be looking at a cold tit. Expertly described there, and you'll notice so far that Dave has got eight out of eight. So we are. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. Thank God for that. <laughs> we're now we're now rooting for Dave for the next seven. So um right in the chat, can you give us let's let's do nine and ten. Let's do nine and ten as a cluster group. Nine and ten together, yeah. That's, and don't don't oh, fall in oh. don't fall into the, the hole. No, do you know what Susie's done? She's done she's done a she's done a she's done a double. She's 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 in brackets, she's put the more commoner name. And she, but she's oh. gone boom and boom in all oh, spot on. Uh, we're nice. getting. I'm I'm lo I'm loving that as well. There we go. Yes, we everyone on my side, Dave. Spot on. Yeah. All correct. Yeah. What have we What have we got here? Well, looking at the uh, the, the chestnut brown back, the, the grey cheeks, uh, the black on the head, and the the black bib and the black on the the, the top of the chest. Um, we're looking at a, a a male house sparrow. Number ten, absolutely. Num on. Number number ten. Although um, one of its names it shares it with the sparrow, it is not um, of the same family. Um, and you can see from the difference in the uh, the shape of the beak, um, as well as the shape of the bird overall. Looking at a. Uh, an insectivorous bird rather than the seed eater that the house sparrow is. Um, with that uh, streaking on the back and on the underparts and slightly slightly reddish brown on, on the back and the gray around the head. Um, and we're looking at the, the dunnock or the hedge sparrow. Dunnock or hedge sparrow, absolutely. And yeah, I, I, everybody sort of getting that was absolutely perfect. Interestingly, yes. obviously, yeah. although it's called a sparrow, um, it's actually sort of part of the Accenta family. Accenta, um, yes. Yeah, but how we, uh, how the uh, UK uh, or the English language decided, oh, we'll have that as a sparrow and then we'll call it a dunnock, um, whereas the rest of the world calls it a hedge Accenta. So, um, <laughs> Brunella modularis. There we go. There's all Dave, Dave's all the Latin. I'm I'm too young to remember Latin. <laughs> That's what I'm claiming. So uh, other other than puffiness, puffiness, um, obviously, which is Manx Shearwater. Um, and interestingly, which again is, is a misnomer. It is. Well, the um, the reason that um, it is an interesting one for you because I went to Scoma 
the uh, the weekend. So I thought I'd actually do oh, some, some reading on, on puffins. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, puff, the word puffin actually in old sort of Greek or Roman and stuff um, actually meant, uh, it's puffin, P-U-F-Y-N, and it actually meant seabird. So it was the, it was the, the seabird. Um, and actually it was, uh, they used to eat a lot of shearwaters, so it used to be called the, you know, it was a shit, it was a, a seabird that was eaten quite regularly. And I think when, you know, I guess the UK nomenclature got hold of it, well, that looks a brilliant seabird. We'll call it the puffin, i.e., the epitome of seabirdness. But because we used to always eat the shearwaters, we'll call them puffinus, puffinus. So, uh, um, that's it. That's that's pretty much my Latin done now. Oh, and fringular colebs. I'm, uh, that's pretty much the only ones I learned. <laughs> um, so we had we had great tip, blue tip, cold tip, house sparrow, and dunnock. Excellent on that one. So we're on the final stretch now. We're on the final stretch, um, and uh, eleven is we we kept this slightly separate as well because you might be thinking, hold on, Simon, why didn't you put this for six and eight? Well, actually, it's a, it's of a different, a slightly different, again, going back into the Latin, it's a slightly different species to the other one, although it has a similar name. Um, so I'll tell you what, we'll do 11 and 12 because they've both got long tails. There we go. There's a clue. Right. Excellent. Oh, ah, there we go. There we go. Susie, you were too quick off the mark there. You've got now put in number 12 as well. There we go. Nobody, nobody's put the um, put the ringing terminology in yet, uh, Dave. Um, I love the ringing one of this. Yeah, the uh, yes, the five-letter acronym for it. Talk us through eleven and twelve, Dave. Okay, so um, number eleven, we've, we've already had some of the family. Um, close, well, not not that close, but the. the, the Close-ish family um, in the, uh, the second row, um, but with the, the, the white crown to the head and sort of the plain size to the head, little, little beady eye, little beady beak, and a um, nice black and uh, black wings with uh, you can just see some pinky red on the uh, just above the black there, and a nice long tail. And it means we've got um, the uh, long tail tit. And if anybody can uh, pronounce the uh, Latin name for it, then again, that extra cake on Saturday. Number 12. Oh, I'm, I'm not going to even attempt 12. <laughs> Number 12 is, uh, this is, this is um, Simon says, is another long tailed bird, but size wise, it dwarfs number 11. And with that uh, that lovely blue colour on the on the wings and the tail, the white sides and the black back and the, the large pink, and uh, there's nothing else that can do it apart from a mute part. Oh, I'm, I'm muted. Um, wonderful. So everyone rooting for Dave. Um, he has managed to get 12 <laughs> out of 12 at the moment. I did say... Um, that if he got all the way to 15, I'd let Nick buy him a free breakfast on Saturday. So he's uh, he's on that final home straight. Um, and what no, we will do it. for these final these final three is <laughs> these should all be relatively common birds in your garden. So we're going to do all three as the final grouping. So 13, 14 and 15. What are they? Oof. That was very fast. That is brilliant. I think they all Everyone's... could line. I think everybody had their finger on the on the buzzer waiting to they'd already typed them in ready to press the return button on that. They did. And I should yeah. point out here that Tim Reed is no longer allowed to identify any form of uh, of pigeon um the, at the weekend. Um uh but he, he is really good at birds in harry potter so uh um or we all want to go to to tim's garden that's what i think there um and i'm loving i'm loving susan's it's, it's, I'm, I'm like, we might we should do this all the time dave but i know you can't <laughs> see it but, but, but it's hilarious some of these uh, answers that we're getting through so um but i will okay. say that um um some of the answers coming in for 15 dave um we do have so uh, so far snowy owl 
and greedy, fat, amorous bird. So if you could take us home <laughs> with the proper identification of these birds. Well, I think greedy, amorous, fat bird is probably sort of quite, quite appropriate, really. Um, number 13, unlucky for some, but for, uh, but for our favourite garden bird, our favourite Christmas card bird. Um, what else can it be with that uh, orange, orange face, even if you can't see the orange on the breast, and brown back, upright stance, nice little insectivorous type bill. It has to be everybody's favourite, the robin. Number 14. So this is, uh, did anybody age this one? Um, so this is Sterna vulgaris. This is uh, uh, a bird that um, used to be in everybody's gardens, isn't so much now. We used to see them as they, I've got a family appearing on my garden that they're leather jacketing at the moment. Um, and this is the starling. Again, with that, uh, that nice winter plumage. Um, it's an adult, a nice spotty back, yellow, sharp, long, sharp yellow bill, um, black plumage. Then, uh, yeah, it has to be a starling it's being accompanied at the moment by lots of pale brown juveniles, which are very pale, very noisy, uh, and very hungry. Uh, talking of very hungry, moving on to number 15. Um, we have this, this large fat thing um, that seems to be in everybody's gardens. And if you're going off on Saturday morning, you'll probably think you're going to run over probably a dozen of these or more as they seem to congregate on the roads first thing in the morning as well. With that yellow beak surrounded by the white, the nice grey head, um, pinky sort of breast. White neck marking in the grey grey wings, even though you can't see the uh, the longish tail with the the black band. This is, of course, the wood pigeon, Columbaris. I can't remember. Yeah, the yeah that that one. Yeah, do you know what? It, it would have been really easy. I mean, I've got more identification guides here than you shake a stick out. What I could have gone is actually got and got one and looked all this stuff up, but no. Um, Columba, um, well Columbus. Done. That's the one. Um, well done, Dave. Um, I'll relay back to Nick. You are going to get your uh, your breakfast on Saturday. So, um, um, <laughs> well, what will happen now is next, uh, next end of season in 2024, Dave will do a quiz and I'll fail it or something. So yeah, um, I'll make it a little bit more difficult. Everybody, everybody will be experts by then. Well, they will. So we do have long tail tip, magpie, robin, starling, and wood pigeon. Um, hopefully, uh, most of you can sort of see just you know potentially how far you've come. You know, if this was put up at the beginning of you know a couple of years ago for a few people, there might have been some tricky ones. But um, hopefully, you can see how how much you've come on, how much you've improved and how easy it is once you get to know some of these species as well. Um, and as I say, I imagine the uh, the greedy, fat, amorous bird, I don't know if that's a, um, typically that's a, that's a Davism. It comes up with quite a lot of these ones of, uh, of stuff. So, um, but yes, these are the way we, we you know, we, we identify them ourselves. So uh, we uh, we come up with these uh, lovely little names. But if that's not a Davism, uh, Susie, that's just your one. Yeah. Oh, no, no, because I know... Because um, I think uh, when Susie was out last time, was, uh, uh, there was some other sort of thing. I was like, oh, is that how Dave, Dave does it? Hmm? <laughs> so um, hopefully you all felt um, nice, uh, nicely and refreshed from the quiz. You all done fantastically. Full marks to everybody. Um, anybody got any questions? Um, you can come off of mute if you want to. Um, or you can pop it into the chat. I've opened up the chat for everybody now again. Um, we... We will be, uh, as I say, at College Lake um, at 7 a.m. The next slide is going to give you a bit more information about that. If you really, um, there's, a, there's a saying amongst the kids at the moment, which is CBA, um, can't be. If you, if, you, if you don't want to get up at 7 o'clock and come and walk around the whole lake and you just think, want a little bit of a lie-in, um, when the reserve opens at 10, come in and get the free breakfast anyway. So um, 
Uh, no worries. Um, cool. Dave's got to shoot off, so um, I'll crack on, Dave, and I'll uh, I'll see you on Saturday, mate. It's just the last slide. See you on Saturday, my friend. Thanks, everybody. See you then. Bye bye. Wonderful. Um, and the last slide uh, before you can all go and have your dinner um, is just a little bit of an explanation of uh, of Saturday. Um, so for those of you that don't know where College Lake is, um, College Lake is uh, just north of Tring, uh, southwest of uh, Pitstone. The best way, the, the um, I'll be dropping this uh, this information into um, the WhatsApp groups as uh, as well. Um, thank you very much, uh, Tessa. Thanks very much, and we'll uh, we'll see you soon. Um, yeah, if you um, the the best way to do it that that um, postcode does take you pretty close to the entrance. If you get on that B488, either coming in from Ivanhoe Beacon, which hopefully a few of you will know, come to the roundabout, go straight on. The car park is on your right. If you're coming up from the south um, and you're coming out of Tring, go past the garden centre, past the pub, come over the canal and the uh, entry, the entrance to um, College Lake will clearly be on your left. Um, I'm aiming to be there. As I say, we've been special dispensation to um, get in early. So I'm aiming to be there at 6.30 to open the gate. Um, the gates will be locked before and they will be locked afterwards. Um, if you are, if you would, if you do need to leave earlier, if you need to leave before 9, 9.30, because the gates don't get open to the public until 10 o'clock. Um, you will need to park outside of the uh, gates. The best one is probably in the pub car park and then walk uh, walk down, but obviously be careful. It's a very busy road. Um, but hopefully most of you can stay and then stay for the for the little celebratory uh, breakfast that we'll be having uh, we'll be having afterwards as well. So if you could aim to get there around about 6.50, 10 to 7, um, Dave and I will definitely be there. We'll have the gate open. One of us will be waving you in. Um, we'll just park. We'll all regroup around that time. We'll then close and lock the gate um, once everybody's in. And uh, then we'll start to walk around the reserve. And that is it. I will stop sharing there. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And uh, I know it's a smaller group, but select and bijou. And hopefully we'll be seeing as many of you as we can on Saturday. Thank you very much, both of you. See no you then. problems. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a so lovely Saturday. evening. Bye. 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 See you Saturday. Bye bye. Looking forward to it. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> See you then. Let's see.